welcome to Prepare Like a Pro live chats. My name's Jack McLean. I created Prepare Like a Pro early in the year. We are a strength and conditioning business that specializes in athlete development for football. We are based in Melbourne, but we're working with male and female footballers all around the country. And if you're interested in working with us, head over to our website, preparelikeapro.com, where you can check out our training packages, online training programs, as well as face-to-face -face options. Super excited to catch up with Kane Johns. Kane is also part of the Prepare Like a Pro coaching team. Here he is, he's jumped on. I'm just gonna send the invite while I go through his intro. He's a very well experienced coach, so the conditioning coach and sports scientist. And he was fortunate enough to be Melbourne Football uh, Club, both in the men's and female works there. Here he is, welcome mate. What's going on? Much mate, yourself? Uh, just cruising. Cruising, got the fan, it's, it, it's summer tomorrow. We're, we've finally got, to, got some heat picking up, which is nice. Yep, this, this study that I'm in has got a couple of computers, so it gets warm very quickly in here. Yeah, fair enough. I'll, I'll ke keep carrying on with the intro, mate, and then we'll get yeah, no into, the, into the questions. Yeah, so Kane's worked with both the AFL men's and AFLW. In fact, he's the head of performance since the AFLW commenced uh, and sports science in the Melbourne team. Prior to working for Melbourne, came as a swimmer. So we're swimming at the national level for 15 years, competing in swimming. Loves hard work and loves challenging his athletes not just physically, but mentally as well, to get the most out of them. And he's completed his Bachelor of Exercise Science and Sports Science, as well as being an accredited coach. So thanks for jumping on, mate. Super excited to have a chat. Take us through the beginning. When did you realise or, or when did you feel like you sort of started the passion to be a, a fitness coach, strength and conditioning coach in this space? It's an interesting one. I wouldn't say I pinpointed an exact time that I wanted to be a strength coach. I think the last, from 16 onwards, when I was swimming, nine times a week and going to the gym three times it was pretty hectic yeah. i enjoyed working hard at that myself but i also had that mindset like analyst mindset that i wanted to know more about why we train so hard why we go to the gym all that kind of stuff so kind of one thing led to another and i grew up in bendigo and there wasn't much for my swimming back there back in bendigo so i had to move to melbourne so at some point there i had to figure out what i wanted to do and I love sport. I love watching sport, everything about yeah. sport, all sports. So I thought, why not? Why not see what it's like to study a Bachelor of, bachelor of Exercise Science and see where it would take me? Yeah. Firstly, I studied it more so for my own knowledge around as I was pursuing, like, could I know a little bit more about the way we train or why we train and then apply it to my own self and my own training and then see if I could find that extra couple of percent. And then one thing led to another, basically, and I started to enjoy it and wanted to work at the elite level and was willing to do anything that it took to get there. Yeah, awesome, mate. And you mentioned the analyst side. Were you exposed to a sports scientist when you were a swimmer? Is that something that is in swimming, no, sports science? Yes and no, in parts. But if anyone knows the swimming or the individual sport in Australia, it is, it's you got to be within the top 1% to 3% in Australia to have access to a sports scientist at that and still to this day, there's there's no clubs or anywhere that, unless you're like affiliated with the VIS and you've met their qualifications, athletes don't have access to those people. So I did in some circumstances, some of the swimmers in my squad were part of the VIS, so they would pop in and they'd right. usually look at the whole training squad as well, not just those athletes. But that was another thing that kind of interests me as well, is like we've got all these people that should have access to these type of people but can't because yeah, because of the, the top, yeah top. and the government i suppose fund these programs and they can't just fund millions and millions they already do and even more just to potentially help an extra one or two percent that probably most likely won't go on to win an olympic medal so yeah so i was a little bit but then that's probably where i thought shit i i want to know more so i can help myself yeah and then one thing legend actually started getting to the coaching side correct yeah correct. How old were you when you did your degree? I didn't Straight start till school, I was, or? no, I didn't start till maybe 19 or 20. So from from school through until I started, I think swimming was a big focus. So I just did, you know, some diploma in sport and rec and little bits yep. and pieces because, yeah, I was just focused on swimming. And then, it, and then I think when I was 19, I really discovered that that's what I wanted to study and that's yeah, what cool. I was passionate about. And so, yeah, started the following year, I guess, yeah, straight away. Yeah. And what was your first job? In strength and conditioning, sports science, exercise science. <laughs> it's a funny one. It was my intern at Melbourne Football Club. Um, oh, I was. Yeah, fantastic. So I was lazy. To get, yeah, I <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was fairly lazy 
in doing my placement hours. Um, and then we got to the third year. I was, I'm sure a lot of graduates would be like, shit, where am I going to do my hours? And then I ticked them all off in the third year working with the International Cricket Council. The ACU, where I studied, had a partnership um, with the International Cricket Council. We're just looking at some bowling analysis, GPS data, that kind of stuff. So that's the yep. stuff that interests me and still does. So I ticked off my hours all there and then I finished my degree and I think, yeah, the, the ACU was trying to get me in to go into the master's program and one of the big things I had was, okay, if I do this master's, do I have a job at the end of it? And if not, what do I need to do? And it was just luckily that I was speaking to staff at ACU where they said that Melbourne Footy Club has an internship. If you race home, I think it was 3.30 that day. If you race home right. and check in the application before five, you've got a chance to get in and I'd... Far out. Didn't break the speed limit, but I got home very quickly, got the application <laughs> in, got an interview, and yeah, was successful. And then from Meant there, it was, yeah, straight forward and, and went from there. So, so you did your hours through your uni degree, finished, and then what happened with Melbourne and, and finishing the degree? Take us through when the degree was finished, what was the process there? A long, long road. So yeah. finished, got to Melbourne, started as an intern, I was more of an analyst, the GPS, the usual yep. GPS in and out collect the bibs, take RPEs, help out in the gym. And that went through the whole year. And at the end of the year, they like, they said, thanks. Thanks for your help. You, you're free to go on to do what you want. And I just had a chat to them. I said, well, unless I was a pain or a pest or I don't have anything else to go to because there isn't any jobs at that time. So mm -hmm. do you mind if I continue on? And they're like, yeah, sure, no worries. So went through and ended up doing another year. And alongside that year, I actually got a job as head of rehab and sports science at Casey. Um, it was Casey Scorpions then at that time yep, yep. Under, under Matt Woolno, who was also working in Melbourne a bit as well. So we worked together and we got through that role uh, whilst interning. And I think at that point I had five jobs. So I had a very busy yeah, well, week. I think it was... Typical uh, Western I think, City, yeah. Yeah, I think I... Come back to potentially averaging close to 75 hours a week of work for the whole year in that oh. second year. And then totaled Crazy. at the end of that year, close to 3,000 hours of unpaid work. And so when I say it was going to do whatever it took, that was it. Then yeah. at the end of that year, that was when the onset of AFLW started. So I was in the forefront of the staff's minds on who would take that. And I was in at the club. I knew their processes. I knew the staff, all that kind of stuff. So... I was lucky, lucky enough to be offered that and then I could build my own team from there. So I did that and, awesome. and then one thing led to another because I was in at the club with the AFLW. They were like, well, continue doing some stuff with the men. And yeah, that just progressed as in that time we had a fair few staff leave the footy club. So while I was working my ass off, other people leaving and then spots opened up and it oh, kind of just, yeah, yeah, to the point where as a start of 20 in charge of management, not so much all of sports science, but more of the GPS, all the GPS, all the load monitoring, all the predictions and training, all the match stuff, game day matches and that kind of stuff. So that was pretty hectic managing the AFLW role as a whole program, My staff, players, coaches, all that kind of stuff, as well as potentially basically being full time in the men's program. So yeah. was, again, be very busy. And yeah, then we got through the 2019 was a pretty rough year. For the footy team, not winning many games, struggling to get momentum, injuries, that kind of stuff. And then we got a new performance department in at the start of last year and mm -hmm. under Burjo, we got some really good staff with Dave Regan, Dave Watts and Phil. And then we went through this year and obviously COVID hit and clubs were forced to make sacrifices. And unfortunately, I was one of those sacrifices who just couldn't meet the salary cap. But yep. yeah, here I am. So a yeah. lot of team sport, a lot of working inside football. So I was yeah. around and aware of everything. But then not to mention my stuff on the outside. I just love endurance sports and I like studying that kind of stuff. So my interests lie in team sports as well as endurance sports. Yeah, fantastic. And you've seen plenty of successful athletes as well as trained with them yourself. Is there a common trait, either mentally or physically, that you've picked up on that you you would like to, uh, or that you spend time when dealing working with a, you know, developing athlete. Is there? I think I think it's a focus. The yeah, it's more mental. It's the do whatever whatever it takes. You can use my getting into the role that I was in, doing the three thousand hours we had from when I started to now. I had we eight or nine interns that started after me and left before me because. Yeah, right. You know, they kind of got sick of it, lacked motivation, and it's the same thing that happens happens with athletes. Like. They have a good four-week, six-week six period of training and they do everything right and then they 
know, take a back step or, or not not do everything to 100%, and they might do it to 95, 90, and that for another six weeks, and, and it goes on and goes on. And then they, at the end of their time, they look back and was like, I didn't make it because I'm not sure why and don't understand that they'll the people that they were competing at were doing everything that they possibly could, and that's just not in the gym or out on the track. It's mm. the recovery, it's the sleep, it's hydration. It's looking after your body. It's making the sacrifices in the social lo- uh, life because if you want to be an elite athlete and you want to be on the TV kicking the winning goals or doing some other sport, there's going to be huge sacrifices in your social life. And a lot of people, I suppose, don't understand that. So I think it's mental, to do, yeah. doing it whatever it takes. And if someone says for you to do something, you go and do it. And then you ask a million questions around why you do it. So then you understand. It's not just like I tell you to get in the ice bath for 10 minutes and you go, yep, and then have no idea why you're doing it because after two or three times when it's cold and it's raining outside and you don't want to get in that ice bath um, and you don't understand why you need to be in there, yeah, you you won't get in. So, yeah. Yeah, and I imagine at the start, if you know, you're in the commencement of the AFLW, there would have been a lot of development in education, bringing everyone up to speed and, and building your team and as well as with the athletes and everything. So what was your strategy around that? How, how did you go about it? I think it was really good because... It was a blank canvas. So the athletes, the females coming into the program had no idea what to expect, how hard it was going to be, the commitment. So anything we told them, they took on board. So they were very, very coachable, which is one of the things I like about the female athletes is they take everything on board. They ask questions. They want to know why. And most of them don't complain. But if you were to say walking into a men's program, for example, that has players have been there for five, seven years and you were to go, I want you to sit in the ice bath for 25 minutes. Just This is just a hypothetical as opposed yeah. to five. And even though you explain why they should do that, they're probably not going to do it because they're like, well, I've been, I get in for five minutes and that's worked for me. So yeah. there's yeah. all that blank canvas where I could explain or program how, our, how we felt was the best for the girls and they were going to do it. Yeah. And so that was really good. Yeah, fantastic. And uh, where were most of the athletes coming from? Were most of them footballers? Were some of them athletes from other sports? If so, what were the challenges with that from a physical point of view? Lots of challenges. Yeah, most of them were footballers. I've had some yeah. form of footy background. There was a couple that come from a dual sport or a different sport. But again, when you say they're coming from a football background, they're coming from a program that didn't have fitness staff. They just had a couple of coaches. They had, right. did their own stuff. They didn't do any conditioning. So they didn't do any injury prevention. They didn't do any weights. So it was like, yeah, we just go out on the weekend and play footy and we train during the week, have a kick round. So it was nowhere near even probably semi-elite, let alone elite. And these girls were coming into a program that required them to have an elite mindset in a part-time program where we would throw, us and the coaches would throw absolutely everything at them in a, a three-hour time slot, where it's education, whether it was education for football, education for us, injury prevention, ACL prevention, strength, running, everything. And then they just had to absorb it, take it in and go home the next day, recover and come back in the next day. So... I think the challenges were monitoring their load and understanding what they can and can't tolerate as opposed to, and once we knew that, we could then better program. But because it was a blank canvas, we were just, were able to do, I suppose, not whatever we felt, but what what we thought was best. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. And what was the week? What did it look like? Was it three times a week for pre-season? Yeah. So again, I'm not sure if it's widely known, but with the AFL and AFLW, that they have an AFL PA that dictate how many hours the girls can be at the club, okay. times they can be at the club, times they have to be at home, all those kinds of things. So 